I was sitting at home in my favorite easy chair. But my thoughts were far from easy. It was four in the morning. Sleepless night in a row for me. The third time I'd woken up in the early morning hours. All because of a problem at work that kept nagging at me. Being a divisional sales manager for a big high-tech firm in a very competitive industry is a job that can have its difficult moments. <laughs> and this was sure one of them. You see, sales had been slipping for the past two quarters, and my boss was putting pressure on me to get my numbers up. I knew I could start to turn things around if I could just find a top-notch, experienced sales rep to round out my sales force. For weeks, I'd been interviewing candidates for the job. And three days ago... I thought I found the ideal person. <laughs> that was the problem. He was ideal. <laughs> if only he'd been a little less than ideal, I might not have been faced with the biggest ethical dilemma of my life. think there's a certain adjustable quality in the universe that wrong finds its own level and right ultimately finds its own level. I believe that. That's Norman Vincent Peale. Among the 34 books he's written, The Power of Positive Thinking has sold more than 20 million copies worldwide. When Dr. Peel and I first started talking, we both agreed that people basically probably know right from wrong. I mean, you can see little kids in the street, three and four years old, saying, that's mine, that's not fair, you shouldn't do that. I mean, who told them? So Dr. Peel feels, and I agree, that we kind of have some inner knowledge. But when we went back out to business people and said that, they said, yeah, that's all well and good, but people don't act like it, and you better give them some guidelines to sort out right from wrong. That's Ken Blanchard, management consultant and co-author of the best-selling book, The One-Minute Manager. Together, Dr. Peel and Dr. Blanchard have written The Power of Ethical Management. This cassette is based on that book and also draws from the author's first-hand experience as consultants to business and business professionals throughout the country. of ethical management is about ethics in business. Not only how to make ethical decisions, but also how to help create a healthy work environment where people don't have to cheat to win. You've already met our central character, the sales manager. In a moment, you'll learn more about his ethical problem. Later, you'll join the sales manager in his search for answers to this dilemma and to the larger questions of integrity and ethics in the workplace. You'll discover how managers can use the three-point ethics check to help them take the grayness out of ethical decisions. You'll also learn about the five P's of ethical power and how they form an effective strategy for business organizations as well as individuals to behave ethically. Above all, you and the sales manager will unravel one of the naughtiest problems facing business. How can you get acceptable bottom line results, stay competitive, and at the same time be committed to ethical practices. It's all here in The Power of Ethical Management. After a month of interviews, the most promising applicant the sales manager had seen walked into his office. His sales record was outstanding. He knew the industry, and he had just left a job with the sales manager's top competitor after six successful years. As the interview drew to a close, the sales manager had just about decided to hire this applicant. And then it happened. He reached into his briefcase, pulled out a computer disk, and put it on my desk. <laughs> then he said to me, Can you guess what's on this? Uh, no. I'm afraid I can't. That little floppy disk alone has enough information on it to put this company's sales right through the ceiling. And I have others. <laughs> Before I left Microbyte, I downloaded everything I could from their mainframe computer, all their customer profiles, the research and development files, everything. In fact, 
right on your desk is all the cost data for Microbyte's bid on that big defense contract, the same one you guys are bidding on. <laughs> that, that's, that's proprietary information. That's, it's confidential. Sure it is, and I have it. And, well, let's put it this way. That information goes where I go. He had two emotions right away. The first one came immediately, and that was anger and rage. You know, how could this guy do it? He's stealing and that kind of thing. And then this other feeling started to come up, and he couldn't deny it because it kept on rising. And the second one is that he and his wife had uh, been talking just the night before, and they got one kid in college and a couple on the way, and they're going to really be strapped financially. They're already feeling a pinch now. And boy, he could really use a promotion, but given where his numbers are now, he doesn't have a prayer for it. And this guy could have been dropped in from heaven because with this kind of information, he could land that big government contract and other fish. And I think that's what an ethical dilemma is. The sales manager decided to talk about this problem with one of the company's senior operations managers. He'd been the sales manager's mentor for a number of years. The older man's reply was a little bit surprising. Hire this guy before someone else does. Don't be naive. Remember the golden rule of business. Then the business golden rule is to do unto others as they would do unto you as the roles were reversed. He said our competitor, they'd hire that guy in a minute. And that kind of surprises the, this sales manager, but here's a guy that's been around a long time, and suddenly he's saying, don't be naive. Now, all of a sudden, you put a message like that in somebody's head, don't be naive, I don't want to be stupid, and that kind of thing. So when he walks out of his office, here he's got support for hiring this guy. And then he runs into his top aide, a woman who who's, uh, went to one of the top MBA programs in the country, and she looks at him and she says, uh, you know, you look troubled, what's going on? And he invites her into his office and, and tells her the story. And she said, you better think twice. She said, this guy would steal from them. Imagine what he'll steal from us. And if it ever comes out, you hire this guy with this kind of information, not only is it going to hurt the company, but it's going to be egg all over your face. And so here what he does is he gets support for both ends of these feelings right away, just five minutes walking down uh, the hall. Should I go ahead and hire this guy? Or should I say thanks, but no thanks? Yeah. Another possibility would be to hire the man. After all, he is the most qualified. And just tell him not to bring his stolen information. Oh, but if I did that, how could I ever trust him to be honest once he started to work here? Then again, maybe I should just turn him in. Call his old boss and blow the whistle on him. <laughs> That'd take him out of the job market and solve my problem. I knew in my heart that what this salesman had done was wrong. And I also knew that it sometimes takes guts to stand up for what you know is right. On the other hand, I didn't want to be naive. If others were doing this kind of thing, maybe I should hire him. Which of our competitors wouldn't jump at the chance to get reliable information and sales talent all wrapped up in one package? Maybe I was being naive after all. The sales manager decides to take some advice from someone outside his company. He remembers an old acquaintance from his college days. She's now working for a company that recently instituted a code of ethics and standards of conduct policy. As part of this new policy, she's been given a two-year appointment as the company's ethics officer to help with the new ethics program and related training. I was lucky that she agreed to meet me for coffee that evening. She listened thoughtfully while I told her the whole story. Finally, I asked her the question I'd been leading up to. So if someone in your company were to come to you with a problem like that, what would you suggest they do? Well, I'd give that person the ethics check. The ethics check? That's right. The ethics check is something that helps people sort out dilemmas like yours by showing them how to look at a problem from several different levels. It has three basic questions, and each one clarifies a different aspect of the situation. In other words, the ethics check helps you to take the grayness out of ethical decisions. <laughs> the old everybody does it excuse. The golden rule of business. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, we question that logic. 
Our companies come to the realization that a lot of the grayness can be taken out of ethical dilemmas if you take the time to sort out the situation. It's easy to charge ahead without thinking and then rationalize your behavior afterwards. Now, now you said this ethics check has three questions. What are they? Well, the first question is pretty straightforward. Is it legal? Well, wait a minute. Let me write this down. Is it legal? Is it legal according to the prevailing law of the state or country or city or municipality? Is it according to company policy? Is it uh, up to the standard that the company wants its employees to exercise? If a person isn't in business, he or she should ask the same question. Is it legal? civilly or is it according to the standard one believes in well is it <laughs> well that's one question i don't have a problem with as far as this guy is concerned he admitted to me that he stole proprietary information any way you slice it <laughs> that's not legal i agree so the answer is no now our company feels that if you do answer that first question with a no, then you can stop right there. You don't even have to consider the next two questions. But I'm not so sure I agree. What I always tell people is that they should go ahead and answer all three questions before making a final decision. What's the second question on the ethics checklist? Is it balanced? By that we mean... Is the decision going to be fair, or will it overwhelmingly favor one party over the other? In other words, would one side come out the big winner at the expense of the other? It's not that everything in life is win-win, but our findings, and Norman and I agree on this, is that whenever you have a big win and somebody has a big loss, for whatever reason, but if it's particularly unfair, you not only have a potential competitor, but you have an enemy. And what usually happens is they always end up lose-lose, that uh, they just don't work out. I mean, you can get somebody to sign a contract, but when they walk out of the room and they feel that I really have been taken to the cleaners, the energy of around implementation, everything just falls off. So this balance question is around fairness. So... If I decide to hire the sales rep and use his inside information, there's no way around it. That would be a big win for our company and a big loss for our competitor. That's right. And when it becomes clear what happened, what do you think your competitor will do? Uh, <laughs> look for ways to get even, I guess. Right again. Let's say they start asking themselves what information they can pirate from you or uh, which key people they can hire away from you. While the two of you are playing one-upmanship with each other, a third competitor could come along and pass you both by. Or you, you both could end up giving your entire industry a bad name. Well, I wish I could trust our competitor not to hire one of our people if the tables were turned. But if the question is, is it fair for me to hire this guy and use his stolen information? The answer is pretty obvious. So even though I've racked up two no's, I'd still like to know, what's the last question on the ethics check? For many people, this is the clincher. How will it make me feel about myself? That's the big question, the one everyone who's making an ethical decision should ask. How does it make me feel about myself? Uh, I'm sorry. Maybe I don't understand. But I thought you were talking about doing what's right regardless of how it makes you feel. I mean, uh, I guess I don't understand why that's even a question. This all gets back to why we chose three questions. The legal question gets you to look at existing standards, laws and company policy, for instance. The second question gets you to think about your own sense of fair play and rationality. And this last question makes you concentrate on your own emotions and your own feelings about morality. So, if I understand what you're saying, you're suggesting that if I do something that I basically know is wrong, I can't help but feel bad. Exactly. Basically, an unethical act will erode your self-esteem, and you can use that self-esteem as a gauge to help you decide what's right. The same is true with questions like, uh, how would I feel if this were published in the paper with my name all over it? Or, uh, w would I like my family to know about this? It follows 
that if you do right, you're going to feel right. So we might philosophically say that self-esteem isn't important, but self-esteem is inherent, and it responds to right thinking, right actions. So even if you don't think it's important, you're going to get enhanced self-esteem if you do what you think and believe is right. People dealing with the whole issue of ethics training in companies are finding that the ethics check questions can give managers the guidance and support they need to make the right choice. And the more you use the ethics check, the more it can guide you into a pattern of doing the right thing that becomes habit forming. Answering these questions isn't going to necessarily make people behave any better, but if they ask them, they're going to be real clear, at least in the gut, what is the right alternative, and I think the grayness will go out of, of the decision. But all three questions as a package, I think, is important rather than just saying it's a legal issue uh, because I think that by itself isn't as powerful as when you add a fairness question and a self-esteem question. Part of the power of ethical management is to apply the ethics check whenever you're faced with making an ethical decision. Here are the three questions once again. First, is it legal? Will you be violating either civil law or company policy? Second, is it balanced? Is it fair to all concerned in the short term as well as the long term? Does it promote relationships in which both sides win? And third, how will it make me feel about myself? Would I feel good if my decision was published in the newspaper or if my family knew about it? As a high school student, I worked in a grocery store after school and on Saturdays in Greenville, Ohio. The owner of the store heard me promising something to a customer one time, which he thought was unethical. So he called me from the back of the store. He said, Norman, excuse yourself from Mrs. So-and-so a minute and come back. I want to show you something. And he got me in the back room and he said, now, son, what you've said to that customer isn't right. And I think you're ignorant of the situation, so let me straighten you out. Now, you go back to her and correct yourself and she may purchase or she may not. Either way, it's okay with me. And I think a manager in a store or in a business affects the ethical experience of his employees and affects the happiness thereby of their lives. So he mustn't let them do a wrong thing if he can help it. Like Dr. Peel, the sales manager in our story felt that it's important to set a good ethical example. The next day, he called his salespeople together and told them what had happened. He announced his decision not to hire the sales rep, with or without his stolen information, and he discussed his own beliefs about ethical behavior. But the sales manager also found himself caught in a dilemma between doing what's right and facing the reality of an unsympathetic workplace. To him and to other managers at his level, the message from above was loud and clear. I don't care how you get the results, just get them. His dilemma now was how do you stick to your guns and really do what you know is right? And he came home with his wife and said, you know, on driving home, I realized that the toughest thing about being ethical might be this doing what is right rather than deciding. And he said, I don't know who to turn to for advice. And she said, well, why don't you go see an advisor, friend of uh, my parents. He was a minister and he's an advisor to people, obviously a Norman Vincent Peale type character. 
because he's been so helpful to my mom and dad, and I'm sure he would be willing to talk to you. He's a real positive thinker. And so since he really feels he has no place to turn, he takes her advice and calls you know, what we describe in the book as the advisor to see if there's something he could learn there. Good. <laughs> Good to see you. Come How on. are you? How are you? I've been expecting you. Thank you. I'm sorry I'm a little late. No. The traffic, you know, you know how it can no be. No problem. But it's very nice to When I arrived at the advisor's office, a man with a friendly face and a warm handshake greeted me. The advisor was as enthusiastic and lively as my wife had described. Everything about him and his office made me feel at home. It's clear to me that you have a real challenge in front of you. You know, when I've been faced with similar problems in the past, I've found that it helps to remember that the worst ethical problems are actually the biggest opportunities for us to grow. How's that? Well, look at it this way. We have the freedom to choose to live ethically or to choose to live otherwise. Having this freedom to choose and exercising it with integrity actually makes us strong. It's a little like building up physical strength. I once sat at a dinner with Gene Tunney, who at that time was heavyweight champion of the world. He was a magnificent physical specimen. So I said to him, Gene, admiringly, I said, Gene, how do you get that way, strong physically? He said, by pitting yourself against difficulty. All exercise is pitting yourself against resistance. That's the way you grow muscle strong. Now, ethics is the same thing. If you're soft and yield, you'll be weak morally. But if you pitch yourself against what you know is evil and do good, you grow strong in your personality. Or call it soul. You're strong in body, strong in mind, and strong in personality. So I guess what I'm saying is, how can you build up inner strength so you can resist external pressure and consistently do what you know is right in a difficult situation? What you have to learn are the five core principles of ethical decision-making. I call them the five P's of ethical power. Purpose, pride, patience, persistence, perspective. These are not only the core principles of ethical behavior, they are also the ingredients for genuine, lasting fulfillment in life. Hmm. Well, on the surface, they seem straightforward enough. Let me go down the list and see if I understand what they mean. The first P is purpose. That would be something like my wanting to increase my division sales without having to buy stolen information. Well, no, I'm, I'm afraid that's not a purpose, really. It's more, a, more of a goal. And no, I'm not splitting hairs. There really is a difference. Well, a goal is something you want to attain, something that's off in the distance, an objective you've set for yourself. That's a goal. And that's very important, and everybody should have goals. But purpose is, you might say, the central motivation of your life. The goal should correspond with the purpose to be relevant. But purpose, why am I alive? What am I supposed to do in the short time? I have on earth. That's your purpose. And your goal might be a salary of uh, $100,000 a year. And then you'd have to ask, does this correspond with my purpose? And will my purpose justify what I do to get that salary? <laughs> Unfortunately, we all know that the road to hell is paved with good intentions. It seems to me that it's not enough just to know that you have a purpose in life. What you really need is something to keep you on track. I guess what I'm saying is, if you have a purpose, how do you stick to it? Well, sticking to your purpose is what I call 
being right with life. It means behaving in a way that you're comfortable with. It also means behaving in a way that makes you feel good about yourself day in and day out. In fact, when you don't feel good about yourself, it's usually time to take stock of things. You have to remind yourself, this is my purpose. And I've been a little careless lately. So you get back on the track mentally and character-wise. I had a man that was a natural-born salesman, but he didn't believe in himself, and therefore he wasn't living up to his potential. I told him, I said, Bill, every morning when you're shaving, you look yourself in the eye in that mirror and say, I am somebody, and with God's help, I can go out today and have a good sales record. Well, he said, I couldn't do that. What would my wife and kids think? I said, they'd think you were becoming quite a man. Well, he became one of the best salesmen I ever knew by doing that. The mirror test. Now, when you talk about the mirror test and feeling good about yourself, it sounds like you're talking about pride, which is the second P on this list. Now, pride. I was always taught that <laughs> pride goeth before a fall. <laughs> in other words, isn't pride something to be avoided? Well, what I mean by pride in this context is more of a feeling, like the sense of satisfaction that you get from your accomplishments as well as the accomplishments of people you care about, like your family or your staff. But honest pride, real pride, regular pride, is the same as self-respect, self-esteem. I'm in the speech-making business, and if I go out and do a bad job of making a speech, I'm not on... I talk 40 minutes and work myself up into a sweat and don't say anything. And if I go out and say, well, they gave me pretty good applause, so I must have been good. That's false pride. If, however, I really work at that speech and give them a solid performance, whether I get big hand and standing ovation or not, I can walk off the stage and on my way want to wash my hands and look into the mirror and I say, boy, you gave him the truth. Then I can walk out there head high with a feeling of pride. I think what you want is pride sprinkled with a fair amount of humility. Someone once put it this way. People with humility don't think less of themselves. They just think about themselves less. <laughs> <laughs> wait, wait a minute. I've got to write that one down. And the problem with people with false pride is that they tend to regard themselves as the center of all things. Every difference of opinion becomes a win-lose confrontation. And since their pride can't allow them to lose, their egos go out of control. <laughs> no kidding. Sounds just like my boss. In fact, that's why I didn't go to him for advice. He'd do anything to make a sales quota because he's afraid of looking bad if he doesn't. He always needs to be right, even when it's obvious he isn't. So all of his people, myself and the other sales managers, have stopped giving him feedback because whenever we do, he takes it as criticism and he yells at us. Kind of pathetic, isn't it? But so typical of so many managers. Oh, boy, don't get me started on my boss. But almost as typical is another kind of negative pride we haven't even talked about. What's that? Self-doubt. You might say that's sort of the flip side of false pride. People with false pride and people with self-doubt are both trying to make up for feelings of low self-esteem. Some do it by moving out into the world and trying to control everything and everybody but others do the opposite. 
They continually downgrade themselves in an attempt to be liked and accepted by others. They don't want to make waves or stand out in a crowd, and they certainly don't stand up well under pressure to do something unethical. That's what I call self-doubt, or having an inferiority complex. And so, I'd say that once we have a purpose and our ego is under control, the third principle necessary for sound ethical behavior is patience. Patience? You're telling me that I should sit back and let the competition walk all over me while I wait for my boss to become ethical? No, that's not what I'm saying at all. An ethical person has patience in the long-term outcome of his or her actions. Call it faith, if you will, although spiritual faith is just a part of it. But it's faith in the process of ethical decision-making. Even though they make the right decision, people often want immediate reassurance they did the right thing. And without faith in their own judgment, they often sabotage the future, as I like to call it. They second-guess themselves and undo what was a good decision. They don't have faith in the process. Well, it's tough to have patience these days when instant gratification seems to be the rule. And I think it's especially difficult for a middle manager, someone who's supposed to be results-oriented and have a lot of drive. Drive is a very good thing. It is basic to the American system. People who have a purpose and a goal and want to succeed have got to have drive. But one can exercise drive too much. And if, if a person has also patience which may be defined as the ability to wait for results or wait for a person to perform or wait for a person who doesn't have the manager's drive, he, the manager, will ultimately get better and more satisfactory results, I do believe. And the first step to becoming more patient is to become aware of what I call a more universal timing, which may or may not be the same as your own. Of course, this speaks to a belief that there is something greater than ourselves. Call it God or spirituality or an ultimate concern, whatever. The point is that you begin to realize that there may be a timetable of events other than your own. When you have patience, you understand that if you do what is right, even if it costs you in the short run, it will pay off in the long run. Anyway, I think the lesson of patience for an ethical person is summed up best by a new twist on an old saying. Nice guys may appear to finish last, but they're usually running in a different race. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you got me there. So let's see. According to my notes, the next P of ethical power ought to be persistence. That's right. But isn't persistence basically the same thing as patience? I mean, if you're patient, doesn't it naturally follow that you'll be persistent? Not necessarily. Patience is important, but without persistence, it's not enough to keep you on track. I think patience is a necessary ingredient of persistence. The patient person can wait wait until the proper moment and the persistent person as i've seen them is always patient because you're aiming at something you have a goal an intended purpose and you mean to achieve it now you can't achieve it today or tomorrow or next week, or next month, or even next year. But if you have the ability to wait, you will ultimately achieve it because you have the continuing persistence that's essential to achievement.
So when you talk about persistence, you're not talking about trying to do something. You're talking about actually doing it. Exactly. In fact, I like to tell people that trying is just a noisy way of not doing something. When you're committed, you find ways to suppress your rationalizations. Even when it's inconvenient, you keep to your moral commitment. When I talk about persistence, I'm talking about this kind of ethical toughness. Winston Churchill was a student at the English school called Harrow. And in his later years, he was invited back to make a speech to the student body of that era. So the old man came in there, and he, he looked the crowd over, and he put his glasses down on the end of his nose, and he always seemed to look over the top of them, and he looked at this great audience of young boys and he said never 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 give up and he sat down that was all he said the speech was a masterpiece and every boy who heard it delivered was exceedingly fortunate because that is the bottom line of success. Never, 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 never give up. I don't know. The more I learn about these five principles of ethical power, the more I realize it's going to be quite a challenge to become an ethical manager. Well, maybe the last one will help you put the whole thing into perspective. In fact, the fifth P of ethical power is perspective. Perspective is the capacity to see what's really important in any given situation. Sometimes, at lectures, I use the illustration of a wheel to show how the five P's of ethical power relate to each other. And perspective is the hub around which the other four P's rotate. It's a central place from which you can oversee the other four principles and maybe take a look at other parts of your life as well. You might ask yourself, why in the world am I here anyway, going through all these problems? Why are you here? you got to think of that if you're any kind of a philosopher, if you're any kind of a thinker at all. So in order to be satisfied as to the value of your presence on earth, in order to be patient and have pride and persistence and purpose, you got to have the right perspective. So if you just the wheel, perspective would indeed be at the center. Hey, you don't have to convince me. I think it's great to have that kind of balance and fulfillment you were talking about. But how can you find it? How can you get a perspective on things? By making sure your inner self wakes up each morning. <laughs> you look a little confused. Well, first, you have to understand that we all have two selves, really. There's our external self, which is task-oriented. It's directed outward toward getting things done. Then there's the inner self, which is more reflective and thoughtful. It's concerned with meaning and values and finding significance in life. Now, the inner self takes longer to wake up in the morning than the external self. In order for that to happen, you have to put yourself into a reflective state of mind. Now, that might mean setting the alarm a little earlier. I know it's tough for busy people to find quiet time in the morning. It's the price they pay for success. But to have a fulfilling life, you have to take the time to maintain your perspective. The wise manager has to reflect and think. In fact, I would add to that that he's got to meditate. 
The best way to do that is to be quiet, absolutely quiet. Sometimes I, if the weather's propitious, I go outside and walk around our house six times. Now, six times around my house is a half mile, and I usually do that with my wife. Now, we don't talk. We oftentimes hold hands, but we don't discuss anything. We walk. Now, we've done our body good, but I think We've done our minds more good. And I swear to you, most of the workable ideas that I've ever had in my life have come to me not in the midst of office work with people bustling in and out, but in these quiet times. Any time you spend in quiet reflection and meditation is not wasted. Once again, here are the five principles of ethical power. Purpose. You see yourself as being an ethically sound person. No matter what happens, you're able to look at yourself in the mirror and feel good about yourself. Pride. You feel good about yourself and don't need the acceptance of other people to feel important. A balanced self-esteem keeps your ego and your desire to be accepted from influencing your decisions. Patience. You believe that things will eventually work out well, and you don't need everything to happen right away. You're at peace with what comes your way. Persistence. You stick to your vision, even when it's inconvenient. Your behavior is consistent with your intentions, and you never, 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 never give up. Perspective. You take the time to enter each day quietly, in a reflective mood. This helps you get more focused and allows you to pay more attention to your inner self. For Dr. Peel, this is the key to perspective. The perspective include the cultivation and education and respect for the inner self is not a substantial perspective. On the second side of this cassette, our sales manager tries to put these five principles to work at the office. Along the way, he meets a management consultant who tries to help him answer the most difficult question of all. Is it possible to stay competitive in business today and still operate honestly and ethically? I've uh, done a fair amount of work in the retail uh, industry, and, and I heard a top vice president of a company said, if we could stop employee stealing, and he said, I don't even care about customer stealing, you can have that. If I can only stop employee stealing, He said, I could reduce my price of products 20% to customers. And my feeling is that if that's going on, there's something happening in the organization that's not supporting people being the kind of people that they want. Ken Blanchard, co-author of The Power of Ethical Management. In the months following his meeting with the advisor, the sales manager in our story began to share what he had learned. He made the three-part ethics check a common practice in his sales division. More and more of his staff began to learn and talk about the five principles of ethical power. And he was even able to find another qualified sales representative to fill his opening. But things were not altogether rosy. While the sales manager began to feel better about himself, he was still disturbed by what seemed to be a lack of support in his company for ethical decision-making. He saw more and more basically honest managers driven to do things that weren't ethical in order to produce a desired bottom line. Sometimes their situations were made even worse because they had been pressured to set goals that were unrealistic. So what I had learned so far was helping me personally to be more ethical. But I was wondering what strategies organizations and managers could use. So I called the advisor, who referred me to a friend of his who's a business consultant. This person had worked with companies all over the world, and he said he'd be happy to talk with me about ethics in the workplace. So, I understand you're interested in business ethics. Well, yes. I've been talking to people in my division about the five principles of ethical behavior. You know about them? Oh, yes. Well, I've been trying to sort things out in my own department. But when I look around the company, I see basically honest people stealing, lying, cheating, 
and covering up. I can't believe they do those things outside the office, but when they're at work, it seems like justifiable behavior. So what I want to know is, how can I try to help the company turn this kind of thing around? You know, it's amazing. The more I work with organizations, the more I'm convinced that it all comes down to how people feel they're being treated by the company and its management, not just employees, customers too. You know the Fortune 500? Sure. Well, my dream is that someday someone will publish a list of the fortunate 500 companies. I got that concept from John Nesbitt, who wrote uh, Megatrends. And John said he had a dream that someday there would be a list of fortunate 500 companies. And that to be a fortunate 500 company didn't necessarily have to do with the volume of sales and the gross profit and all kinds of things, but had to do with the quality of life available to employees and the quality of service given to customers. And so when we talk about Fortune 500, we're not talking about a company that's not profitable and not effective because it has to be. But a Fortune 500 company is paying attention to the details and to the issues around their, their employees and their customers. And one of the things I'm convinced of, and the consultant tells our young friend, that Fortune 500 companies also will practice the five principles of ethical power that they only, not only apply to people as individuals, uh, but they apply in organizations. So you think the five P's of ethical power apply to organizations, too? Absolutely. When I was in Japan a few years ago, I heard a talk by the chairman of the board of Matsushita Electric. He was then, oh, about 88 years old. <laughs> Just a kid. <laughs> right. Anyway, one of the executives I was with asked him a question. He said, sir, what is your primary job as chairman of the board of this great international company? And without hesitation, he said one of the most interesting things I've ever heard from a top executive. He said he was the soul of his company. Through him, the values pass. And I really like that concept of soul. And that's that belief that the first P, purpose in organizations, where does it start? It starts at the top. It starts with the vision, the mission. Now, people at middle and supervisory levels can support that, but it's pretty hard for the mission and purpose of an organization to start at the bottom and move up. So it's really that whole thing of, of coming down and that whole concept of, of soul is a neat way to think about purpose in organizations. You know, what business are you really in? What is the mission of the organization? And I think organizations that are ethical, organizations that have people behaving ethically, have a clear mission from the top. And this sense of purpose could be expressed in a company's mission statement or in a code of ethics and standards of conduct policy. Any examples of this? D do you know of any... Fortunate 500 companies? Oh, sure. I hear good stories every day. There are lots more ethical managers out there than the scoundrels and cheats you hear about. Because we don't tend to make celebrities out of the good guys, we just aren't aware of them as much. I'll never forget uh, with Hewlett Packard. Early on in their existence, they had an opportunity to have a, a million and a half dollar contract with the government that they could have turned around that product in nine months, but they would have had to hire thousands of people and then lay them off nine months later. And Hewlett and Packard, Bill Packard, said, I'm sorry, that's just not the kind of business we're going to have. We don't operate that way. And I was sitting in a plane recently from Hewlett Packard, and I said, is that kind of thing still true? They said, we make every effort in this company not to let somebody go. We will transfer and we will do every opportunity and they have stuck to that belief and to me that's soul that's a mission that's a a belief in in something it sounds to me like the kind of company you're talking about must have an ethical purpose that's spelled out i mean if you don't have a clear vision of what you want the company to be it's probably going to be something you don't want that's right and when there aren't any standards for behavior anything goes and that's a larger issue than how people feel about the company if you don't have purpose, then it's pretty hard to have the pride. I think that's why we, we have them following. And when we're talking about pride is we're talking about people really feeling good about what the company is and what the company stands for. But another belief that I have that we have in the book is that pride starts from the inside and moves out. 
and that if you are in a work environment where you don't feel you're appreciated, you're not supported and all, after a while you don't feel real good about yourself and it's pretty hard then to feel real good about the company. And so pride builds on how you feel about yourself. One of the sayings I like to use when I talk to organizations is one that supposedly comes from Ben Franklin. You can't expect an empty bag to stand up straight. <laughs> In other words, you must help people build up their self-esteem before you can expect them to be strong. What often happens in organizations, the purpose is not clear, and then people run around catching people doing things wrong, and beating on them and all, and then they say, be loyal, and they say, and the thing just doesn't work. And the big bugaboo, and I came on pretty strong in several pages in the book, are on performance review. I mean, I go around the country and I say to people, how many of you are thrilled, excited with your performance review system? You really think it's motivating. And, and people just laugh. The only people who ever had raised their hand is personnel directors, you know, who wrote the system. There's two problems with performance review. One are organizations that don't have one. You know, somehow they think, well, we're wonderful people. And all. I want to tell you, you aren't doing anybody any good because they don't know how well they're doing. You see them at the end of the day. How'd it go today? Oh, it was really busy. Because most people don't know what they're supposed to be doing. And so we find that performance review is really important. If you don't have one, you're not doing any good. Now, a lot of people have them, but they're set up as if your main goal as a manager is to sort people out. Because you have six or seven people working for you, and if you rated them all high, if you had a 10-point scale and you rated them all high, what do you think your boss would do in most stories? they rate you low. They'd say you're too easy, you're giving away the farm, only Mary Lou Retton gets 10, and all. And it doesn't take people very long to realize if I rate all my people high, then I get rated low. Aha! The only way I can get rated high is to rate some of my people low. Now the toughest job of a manager is becomes, who am I going to take to the cleaners? See, because somehow there's this normal distribution mentality. And I taught for 10 years in universities, and I was always in trouble. I was investigated by some of the best faculty committees. And the thing that absolutely drove the faculty crazy is the first day of class, I always give out the final exam. And the rest of the faculty say, what are you doing? And I say, I'm confused. And they say, uh, you acted. I said, well, I thought we were supposed to teach these kids. You are. But don't give them the questions in the final. And I'd say, not only am I going to give them the questions in the final, what do you think I'm going to do all semester? I'm going to teach them the answers. So when they get to the final exam, what do they get? They get A. Life is all about getting A's, not some damn normal distribution curve. I mean, the things start to get into vicious circles, where what we find is an effective performance review system has clear performance planning, where purpose and goals are really clear out front, including of how you're going to measure them. Then day-to-day -day coaching. What is day-to-day -day coaching? Teaching them the answers. And then performance evaluation when you sit down and look. And what happens is most companies start with evaluation. They get a, some stupid form, and then they might set a few goals, but the one thing that nobody ever does is day-to-day -day coaching, which is I'm on your team. See, what I want to get managers to do is philosophically turn the pyramid upside down so that they think that they work for their people, not their boss. And that I see a manager as a service organization for their people. And if you do that, now you have a whole different kind of environment because what am I in charge of? I'm in charge of pride. How does pride come? From accomplishment. Therefore, my job is to help my people win, not to sort them out. This all sounds great, the way you put it, but I just can't imagine my boss going for this idea of day-to-day -day coaching. He's not about catching people doing things right. He's more of a combination judge and jury. In fact... One of the insights I got from my talk with our friend, the advisor, was the realization that my boss probably acts the way he does because of low self-esteem. Now, that's not something I can change. He has to do that for himself. Doesn't he? Well, yes, but you can help. The whole idea of catching people doing things right goes in both directions. When was the last time you caught your boss doing something right? <laughs> You're not serious. Oh, yes, I am. If your boss doesn't think much of himself, then it's logical that those feelings can be reinforced by the way his people treat him. I'm sure the minute he sees you coming, he gets ready for a win-lose power struggle. Why? Because he sees you always catching him doing things wrong. And this only makes him feel worse than he already does. 
Now, if you want to make a difference in your relationship with your boss, you've got to start turning that around. Hmm. I suppose that could also make a difference in the way he relates to me and the other managers. Sure. It goes all the way down the pyramid. To you, from you to your people, and finally from them to the customers. Remember Ben Franklin. You can't expect an empty bag to stand up straight. And so I think it's important for a company not only to have ethical values and beliefs, but to trust that its values are right over the long term. For management, that means focusing on the long-term aspects of the business, such as product quality, quality of service, your relationships with suppliers, customers, the community, just a whole range of concerns beyond the bottom line. And I'll never forget uh, Norman Rockwell had a wonderful Saturday evening post-type uh, picture of a guy getting chewed out by his boss, and the next frame he's chewing out his wife, and next frame the wife is yelling at the kid in the last frame the kids got the cat backed up to the door and is about ready to kick him and what happens is that if you think of an organization as a pyramid you feel all of the pressure moving from the top down onto these people middle and supervisory managers and if there is this kind of seagull manager approach you know the seagull manager flies in makes a lot of noise dumps on everybody and flies out what happens is people feel under tremendous pressure down there to figure something out because they don't see any way out because they feel the weight coming down uh, on them. And that's a tremendous dilemma. And I think that's where organizations really need to take a hard look. So sound ethical practices happen in organizations that have the patience to trust the decision-making process and not take shortcuts, make compromises or whatever to get the short-term results. If you go around the established process to get the quick results, look what happens. Say you cut services to customers or employees in order to save money. Customers will find what they want from a competitor. Employees may try to get even with the company by lying or theft. Why? Because customers and employees feel they have been treated poorly. So how do you turn around a situation like that? Very slowly. <laughs> It'll probably take two to five years of concentrated effort. You have to start with a clear purpose and maintain that purpose with patience. I think what patience means is that you have belief that your organization is going to make it in the long run. The chairman of the board of Mitsushita, the Japanese company, where it talked about being the soul. Somebody also asked him whether they did any long-range planning, and he said, yes, we do. And I said, well, how long is your plan? He said, 250 years. <laughs> and said, what does it take to implement it? Patience. And uh, I think if a company gears themselves up for being around for the long haul and being of service to people, now the whole up-and-down trend in the economy and all these kinds of things aren't as important because you are built up to to last and now you can be patient if, if business comes the example we use in the book came from a couple of young heads of a company in skinny atlas new york where i go in the summer bill allen and lou allen and uh, i was talking to them and they just had said just recently they had turned down a million and a half dollar offer on a government contract on a product that they had that passed government regulations on quality but didn't pass their own. In other words, it wasn't up to their standards. And their company had been started by their great-grandfather. And they said, for 50 years, we do not do business by giving people products that we don't think are up to our quality. Now, how did you do that, I say? Well, you know, it'll come back. It'll come back. And that fall, I happened to run into one of the top managers of the company and he said hey you know that story on that it came around they got a contract out of the blue uh, that they never expected for about two million dollars so patience is the capacity to let it pass I mean let this one go that's we're not in that kind of business you know thinking about those two managers who turned down the big government contract <laughs> now that was more than just patience they were persistent in sticking to their product quality standards even though they didn't have to. That's right. Persistence for them, or for any organization, obviously means that management sticks to its commitment. It does what it said it was going to. Agreements are kept. 
So it sounds like patience and persistence are closely related to each other. Persistence comes in where patience starts to wane, because you know it will. <laughs> because particularly if you see all kinds of things. And being persistent is sticking to your guns and doing what you said you were going to do. And I had an interesting discussion in a conference I was at with Warner Earhart, who was somewhat of a controversial figure uh, with the founder of Vest and, and all. But commitment is a really important concept that he's believed in a long time. And I asked him, what is commitment in your sense? He says, commitment is when you live as if your word is you. And really a nice way to think about it because... You know, if you made a commitment to do something and then all of a sudden it becomes inconvenient, you know, and all this and that and all. Yes, as if your word is you. So we're not caring about whether you, how you feel or anything. This is your word. And there's a difference between organizations that are interested in being ethical and those that are committed. It's just like individuals. People who are interested in doing something always have an excuse where committed people know nothing about excuses, only they know about results. And Art Turok, who wrote a book called Getting Physical, really put that to me one time, the difference between interest and commitment. And I think it's a really important distinction at the organizational level. What about, say, a, a situation where the company CEO stands up and talks about the importance of honesty and integrity and, and so on, and then you turn around and the company's own advertising is full of misrepresentations and maybe even outright lies. Well, clearly these managers are not being held accountable for their company's lack of commitment. Without some kind of accountability, the most wonderful ethical program in the world is doomed to failure. Yes, the intention, the goal, the destination is all important. That's what purpose is all about. But what we need to do is make people understand that it's the managing of the journey that's going to get the job done. And so often we don't take that in consideration. We say, okay, we're going to do something differently now, and that we announce it, we have a big day and everything, and then nobody ever manages the journey. And yet it's the day-to-day -day thing which is managing consequences. And one of the things that has to go hand-in-hand -hand with creating an ethical environment is consequence management, which is when somebody doesn't follow the rules, what happens to them? And what you can't get into on the implementation of something is situational ethics, where, you know, wow, well, this guy's important, and if uh, you have a policy about something and somebody breaks the rule, there has to be a consequence. An example we have in the, in the book is uh, the guy who had a policy about not taking gifts from customers. And uh, he made a national search to get a top guy uh, in this uh, particular job. And uh, he happened to go by his office, and, and the phone rang, and nobody was around. This was his boss, and he picked the phone up, and the guy said, I just want to tell you, I'm glad the contract has been closed. We're looking forward to doing business with you, and your case of wine is on the way. And so when he came back later when the guy was there, he said, what's the story on that? And he said, oh, he said the guy was excited about it. And he said, what can I get you? And I just in a kiddingly way said, you know, a case of wine. He said, what are you going to do with the wine now? He says, I'm going to send it back. He said, right. And he said, I just want to tell you that uh, since this thing has worked out in this sequence, you are okay on this. But never again. You understand what the policy is. And in fact, uh, about three or four months later, he had to fire the guy because the guy was was doing. Those words spread out. I mean, are you going to have a policy or, or not? And see, I think organizations are enterprises that have goals to be accomplished, and people are individuals who have needs to be satisfied. The way you get a productive, motivating environment is to make deals with people, which is, if you will help me on this, then I will help you get this. If you follow the code of ethics, and if you do that, then you get to partake in the benefits of this organization. If you don't, then there are consequences. Sounds to me like it can be a little bit dangerous to have a management consequence program. I mean, take the case of wine story. I know what it's like to have to make a nationwide search to fill a key job, and then to have to fire that person. You have to go through the whole process all over again. 
You could be backed up for months. That's true, and that's the kind of decision you have to make early on when you decide to be ethical. You have to ask, is this company going to be ethical all the time or just when it's convenient? Because if the answer is when it's convenient, then there's no point in having an ethical policy. In the case of Wine Story, the general manager felt that he had to stick by the ethics code and standards of behavior policy of his company, and he stuck to his guns, and he was accountable. Now, sometimes you do lose out in a big way, but I can tell you case after case where a big short-term loss was evened out in the end by a company that stuck to its guns and remained accountable. Beautiful example of standing by what they believe is Johnson & Johnson with the whole Tylenol thing, which was McNeil Lab. And here the people contaminated people, and not one time did Johnson & Johnson do anything that suggested that the customers were not number one. And you look at the mission statement around Johnson & Johnson and service to customers, service to doctors and all for the health of the people in this country is a number one purpose. And I think any other company that did not stick persistently to what they believe would have gone out of business. And it didn't only happen once, it happened twice. And every time they stuck to their immediately took it off the market, and we'll do this. And the American public says, my God, they believe in what? And you know, Tylenol is right back up there uh, uh, the leading the pack again and that kind of thing. And there is an example. They lost billions. I mean, it was big time. I mean, it wasn't just a minor thing there. And that's what organizational persistence is. That both Johnson & Johnson started with their family and that belief. And they, they say, well, but, you know, that was wrong. Something happened and we're going to safety of the customer and the health of the customer comes number one. In companies as well as individuals, patience and perspective are key ingredients in building ethical power. On this side of the cassette, the sales manager has learned how the ethical business believes its values will lead to success in the long run. In addition to patience, it also has the persistence to make sure its policies are consistent with its actions. Well, you know, one of the questions I'm asking people in companies all the time is if your top management gave us out a sign a plaque to put on your desk and there was two choices and one choice was don't just sit there do something and the other choice was don't just do something sit there what would they do and everybody says of course it don't just sit there do something and we tend to run organizations ready fire aim now peters and waterman talk about that being great for innovation and creativity and it is it's not the way you manage people it's not the way you manage organizations and you know that ad that came out a number of years in the auto go with the automobile is you're going to either pay me now or pay me later and what happens with ready fire aim you spend all your time cleaning up the messes and uh, where I love that saying, if you take care in the beginning, the end will take care of itself. And so often we just don't take that caring time in the beginning. We don't take the pausing time to think and step back and put things in perspective. That's what perspective is. So when you're talking about perspective in an organization, what you're really talking about is planning. Sure, to a large extent. Planning in the sense that an organization takes the time to lay the foundation for its future success by looking at where it is and its strategy for where it wants to go. But I'm also talking here about a choice of how to make decisions. For example, I've seen a lot of managers who are rapid-fire decision makers. They spend very little time planning or reflecting, and they cut other people out of the process. And because they don't take the time to reflect, to balance the pros and cons, to get additional information, or talk to other people, all too often their decisions are not balanced. Yeah, I know all about that management style. Doesn't do much to promote any kind of commitment, does it? No, and without commitment from your staff or your employees, it's very hard to implement a decision. So the shoot-from-the-hip kind of manager often spends a lot of unproductive time putting out fires caused by the results of an unpopular decision. Very unproductive. So, you're saying if managers would spend more time to reflect before they made a decision, then a lot of energy could go into getting things right the first time instead of fixing what went wrong. But isn't there a danger you can overplan and maybe even analyze the situation so much that you blow an opportunity or, or just never get out of the planning stage? Well, sure. Too much of anything can be a problem. 
What's needed is a certain balance, balance between planning and implementation, balance between reflection and action. I've known a lot of managers who were able to strike this kind of balance. Each of them had a different technique he or she liked to use, but always the effect was to develop a perspective on something. Morris Massey talks about taking a mental helicopter to the ceiling and looking down at what you're doing. I really love that kind of uh, visual image of, you know, here we are with a problem. Let's all go to the ceiling here and take a look at this. And you look around, look at all those people around the table, and I'm there too, you know. And how do you do that? I had one manager that has a wonderful suggestion that I have tried a few times, and unfortunately I'm on the road and too much to really implement it uh, the way I'd like to, but he said whenever he gets a major decision or a problem that he has to deal with, he calls all the important people that either have information or are going to be important in the implementation together to talk about the problem. And he says the first part is give me all the information. Everybody gets it all. When he finishes, he says, okay, we're going to now move to solution. But before we move to solution, I want you to sit there quietly in your seat for 10 minutes and look for the answer within. And I tell you, the first time I tried it in our company, people are very uncomfortable. You know, I mean, 10 minutes and all. I mean, hey, let's get on with the meeting, you know, and this kind of thing. And, and what the manager said is it, he's not fascinated so much by what people do those 10 minutes because some people doodle, some people pray, some people meditate. What he's been amazed at is the synergy that comes out and the creativity and all – out of that 10-minute kind of thing that people have a chance to look for the answer within. That's the only instruction he, he gives. And so few organizations are willing to step back from what they're doing and put it in perspective. Well, that's really extraordinary to me. We have a lot of meetings back where I work, but most of them are just a waste of time. What happens is people seem to be getting into various little power trips. They interrupt each other, change the topic. We just end up going around in circles. And at the end, the boss just announces the plan that he already made before the meeting, and that's it. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult for an organization to get people to think as a team. It takes time and patience. But there's a couple of things any company can do. One approach it can take is to set aside some time at the beginning of the business day just for reflection, nothing else. This is really analogous to the way you put perspective into your own personal life. Another way for a company to get its perspective on an annual or semi-annual basis is with a group retreat for middle and top management. But you have to be careful that consequence management is in effect. There's no point to making a lot of noise and coming up with wonderful ideas and goals at a retreat if you all come back and it's business as usual. To me, Having perspective in any business simply means that you're consistently walking your talk. Now, in other words, you take the time to check to make sure that what you're doing is consistent with what you said you'd do. And that kind of perspective means that you're more likely as a company to stay on an ethical course and still achieve your long-range goals. As the sales manager in this story has learned, the five P's of ethical power can form an effective credo for ethical behavior in organizations as well as individuals. Here is one way a business can summarize these five principles into a company credo that might form the basis for an ethics code and standards of behavior policy. Number one, purpose. The vision and the mission of our organization are communicated from the top. Our organization has a soul made up of the values, hopes, and vision that guide us and help us to determine what is acceptable and unacceptable behavior. Number two, pride. Our people feel proud of themselves and our organization. These feelings are at the root of our behavior. We know that when our people feel this way, they can resist the temptation to behave unethically. Number three, patience. We believe that actions in keeping with our ethical values will lead us to success in the long term. This involves maintaining a balance between obtaining results and caring how we achieve those results. We have faith that things will work out in the long run if we act according to our beliefs. Number four, persistence. 
We have a commitment to live by the values, hopes, and ethical purposes communicated from the top. We are committed to commitment. We make sure our actions and policies are consistent with our intentions. Number five, perspective. Our managers, our employees, and our organization as a whole take time to pause and reflect, take stock of where we are, and evaluate where we are going and how we are going to get there. So the story kind of ends about a year later where our young hero is saying to himself, patience and pride, patience and pride, over and over again. And, and he really decided to stay to try to see if he could make some change. And, and he put an ethics code in his own department, and he did a number of things. And he felt at times he was making progress. And all of a sudden, some kind of seagull thing had come down and some crisis around. The numbers aren't. Everything would be thrown out the window. And he finally lost his patience and, and thought, my God, I don't think this thing is ever going to change. And he talked it over with his wife, and they decided that he would look for another position. And so he goes out and looks and uh, finds this company and goes to see the people on a vacation day because uh, it's very important since he's now very ethical <laughs> that he doesn't go for interviews on company time but takes a vacation day and goes over and the policy of that company when they hire a person at his level the chairman and the president everybody wants to talk to him he can't believe talking to these people i mean they absolutely agree with where he is now and his philosophy and he from all intents and purposes he thinks they really practice the five p's and so he decides he's going to go and so he's uh ready to resign from his president company and he decides he's do one last thing before he resigns he goes to see the chairman of the board makes an appointment, flies to Chicago to see him. And he said, I just want to tell you that I'm resigning and you don't, you know, really know me necessarily, but I I felt I owed it to you to be honest. This has been a good company for me to tell you what I think's going on and why I'm leaving. And then he lays out the whole scenario about why he thinks that it's unethical there and the pressure for numbers and all. And the chairman of the board uh, is really taken back by uh, what he says. And he said, will you give me a few days just to check on what you're saying? Please don't resign yet. Give me a chance to get back to you. And, and about three days later, he gets a call at 10 o'clock at night from the chairman. He said, I've checked things out, and you're absolutely right. And I've talked to the president and other people, and we'd like you to stay. We want to create a new position where you will be directing a whole effort to change the organization and where we're going in terms of our ethical behavior. And so now our young man, at the end of the story, is confronted by like the lady and the tiger kind of analogy, where he has one choice to go to a company that's completely consistent with where he believes. It'll be a very supportive environment. It's a very good job. And now the other choice is to stay and see if he can really turn it around. Uh, which would you do? Which would you choose? There is no right or wrong answer to that question. But even though you may not be a sales manager or even work in a business at all, the situation is common and the choice is real. Many people face tough ethical decisions every day. The temptation is often to rationalize unethical decisions. Those rationalizations can be as varied as the people who invent them. But the underlying doubt remains. How can it pay me to be ethical? What's the tangible here and now benefit of doing what's right? How can I justify my ethical behavior when all around me, others are cleaning up by being unethical? I sometimes think of this as the bottom line generation. It's the bottom line that I'm after. And I don't think of anything other than the bottom line. Maybe that phrase is well-fashioned because it sometimes is the bottom. 
if you are a devotee of the gray area and if you believe that the old moral values have been repealed by somebody and that they're no longer operative and you can get insider information and make big deals and have not a Chevrolet but a Cadillac and maybe even a Rolls Royce and you belong to the country club and you are a terrific golfer and you are somebody in the social life of your community you've got it made you think and it's all due to the bottom line well now so far so good they would say so far I would say watch out because this may be a fortune built on sand it was developed on sand and not on a sturdy foundation and it may go sour on you your wife may have become the social idol of the town but her characters change and yours has too and your kids have got too much and they all going to hell too so you may hold your own but I want to ask you are you as good a person as you were when you started out? Can you go into your high-class bathroom and look yourself in the eye in the mirror and be proud of yourself? Do you feel 100% good about yourself? Would you like to be real or have to write yourself off as a phony. At the end of the power of ethical management, the sales manager is faced with the choice of staying where he is and trying to make a change or switching jobs and joining a fortunate 500 company. But the ending could have been different. His efforts at bringing ethical values to the workplace could have been disastrous to the success of his own career. Instead of choosing which of the two jobs to take, what if the sales manager had been out of a job altogether? Ken Blanchard feels that the ending might have been changed, but the character of the sales manager would not. Success is a real sneaky problem that a lot of people don't think about and that Failure and trauma and all these kinds of things is you got a choice. Am I going to do something about it or not? And I think the book would have ended with this guy saying, damn it, I'm better than this. I mean, I have made mistakes and all, but, you know, I stood for something I believed, and to me that's still important, and uh, it might not have turned out right, but, damn it, I'm going to get back on purpose, and I'm not going to sit here and and say, you know, it's a rotten world and all, because there's a lot of rottenness in the world. There's a lot of unfairness, you know. I mean, it never was supposed to be easy. And uh, I think he would have then uh, had to pull himself up by the back streets or stay on the ground. And that's, I think, the way it would, would be that the choice would have ended. What would you do? Stay down? kill yourself, die, be miserable, or decide today's the beginning of the rest of my life and get back up and say, now what am I going to do? I'm not going to forget what my beliefs are. <laughs> 